Hello and welcome to the Raptors show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soup. It's time to get fired up. Make sure you find the Raptors show wherever you listen to podcasts. Subscribe. Please rate and review the program. I'm your host, Lynn Blue. Continue to be joined by co-host Blake Murphy. Blake, what's going on? How was, how was your morning so far? I was good, man. I went to uh, Centennial College today and, and did a little thing with uh, with one of Shai Davidi's classes oh. over there, a sports journalism class. So wow. uh, that was uh, a fun use of the morning. Um, what you what what is what was your biggest advice you gave to the kids? <laughs> Don't be a jerk. <laughs> um, oh, okay, good, good. Yeah, good, I mean, yeah. like in seriousness, I played a little on the like, hey, this industry can be competitive, and you can feel a certain way about there being shrinking jobs and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But like, you can't let that affect how you treat people and like the and like how you treat people because it's good to treat people well. But also mm-hmm. like a huge fun part of the job. And we were just talking about this off air. Is like the fun you have like being around and like making friends around the beat and and w- right. around the teams and stuff like that and like. Yeah, you got to be a little competitive and look out for your opportunities, but you also don't want that to, uh, you know, bleed into like the relationships that make it that help make the job so fun. That's nice, man. Do you yeah. do this often? Do you? I mean, not this specific thing. I, yeah. I've done Shy's class in the past. I've spoken to classes mm-hmm. in the past. Usually, it's more of like a, a student will hit me up for like a coffee one on one or whatever. Yeah. I know you do some of that stuff too. That's, you had it. That's the absolute best, man. Yeah. Especially when you then see them actually start to get in the building and then start to yeah. continue to build on their careers. Like it's, it's so rewarding. Yeah. So. For most of them are rewarding. And then sometimes it turns out to be Samson <laughs> and you're like, why did I, why did I be a good person in this case? Should have left him in Saskatchewan. Should have left him right. in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Man, you had a, an eventful morning as well. The Raptors yeah. did their, uh, uh, and I mean, annual, it was at one point annual. I don't think it was the last couple of years um they but, did it last year as well okay. last year was the first one i went to with, with nick nurse but um i believe the coaches open house started with Dwayne casey yes yeah. uh it certainly was a, a staple of Dwayne casey era so you were down there today this is mm-hmm. obviously this is a great thing for the the basketball community in toronto because coaches at, at multiple different levels can come out and see how darko operates at practice how an nba practice operates but it's also the one time of year, other than like maybe if they're slipping during training camp, that yeah, we can actually see right. what's going on. Because sure, yeah. for anyone who doesn't know, when we go down to a practice as media, mm-hmm. we are outside of that room until it opens up for B-roll. And at that point, like it's mostly guys just getting their individual work in. Right. Hey, I'm going to do some three-point shooting, those shooting drills that we talked about with like mm-hmm. Dennis and Malachi and Garrett Temple where there's yeah. a little bit of money in the in the middle. But none of that is like team level, five on five, access to what they're running offensively. Or even like, you don't even get the sense of what is the team focused on today. Yeah, yeah. This old coach's open house is a little different. We get to be in there a little bit more. We, not me, uh, I was I was doing this thing at Centennial College, but you were down there. Yeah. How was it? Uh, first off, it was really great. Um, I really enjoyed doing the events. I believe, actually, the Raptors sent out an email. I think you can sign up, especially if you are a coach at some level, and it doesn't have to be in, at any sort of substantial level. It could be as low as, like, you teach, I don't know, junior school, like, you're, you know what I mean? You're teaching toddlers. But um, in any case, yeah, they hold this event. You can sign up, and you can go watch. And as you mentioned, it's a really rare opportunity to get to see how a coach operates yeah today we're talking about practice that's what we're mm-hmm. talking about right now but it was actually yeah uh, really cool um you know i think for me it was just uh as a reporter i wanted to see first off just like you know how's the team look you know what wh- who's around um so i think injury update wise it was actually for me it's good to see scotty around and trying to not participate but at least like being engaged and being around the group he had his uh his hand in a sleeve okay which is which is good I like kind of like a soft like our like a hand wrap kind it's of kinda like, like the Kyle Lowry oven mitt. It, no, no, no. It's kind of like you know, like an arm sleeve. Yeah, yeah. But that, but for your hand over your hand. Okay. Yeah, but Interesting. ultimately, like I, I guess he was he was around and he was trying to be in a you know be involved. Jakob was there. He had his hand in a splint. So sorry, when you say Scotty was being involved, do you mean more like from a like coaching cheery on perspective, or yeah, did he, yeah. was he t- he wasn't touching the ball or anything yet? I mean, he was playing with his own basketball okay. off to the side, but yeah, he was but off to the not, side. he's like, not catching passes or anything like no, that. No, no, he's no. Being very I, I would love okay. to see if that was the case. Okay, but so Jakob's in a splint. Jakob was in a splint. Chris was also hanging around as well. Chris Boucher, obviously, he's, he's out for a while um, as well. But um, yeah, in general, just to see them go through what they wanted to go through. And I think at first, you know, what struck me was they're doing a lot of defensive fundamentals i know dark was talked about this a couple of you times you watch these last couple games you watch a transition <laughs> defense recently yeah the, the, the world is working as much on transition defense but like we're talking about like really really um almost i wouldn't even say simple but like you know they're working on fundamentals so they'll have like like we talk about like like box out drills and stuff oh yeah we're Which talking about box out drills practice. 
oh, we're talking about practice today. Yeah, we we they had the assistant coaches just like throw the ball up in the air and, you know, an assistant coach versus a player, you know, jostling to get, you know, the possession. Like, do you remember that when, level of basic? Do yeah. you remember when ESPN used to do those like sports science series? Sure. Yeah. Do you remember when Kevin Love had to box out a sumo wrestler? Yeah, I did. Yeah. That's yeah. what they're doing. They got to bring in. I, I don't know that we have a lot of sumo wrestlers here in Toronto, but they got to, <laughs> yeah. they got to bring in some big boys. For no, like box out an offensive on. lineman. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah, box out an Argo or yeah. something. Yeah. No, yeah. Where's but, O'Shea's brother? <laughs> uh, oh yeah. That's right. He was with the Argo. Yeah, he was at the 905 game the other day. Yeah, all right, cool. Um, but yeah, they, they were doing that. They were doing like, again, really simple drills, like just pressuring the ball to have like two teammates line up on the other side of the lane. And then they would have one player kind of shuffling in between trying to pressure the ball, prevent passes again, like really, really simple, basic stuff. And of course they built out towards that to more pick and roll coverages and things like this. But in general, that was the thing for me. I was like, wow, they're, they're actually in here working on boxing out. So to that, look, this is not, I know it sounds a certain way because like, Oh, you, you assume that everyone should have the fundamentals down. You get to the NBA, you should know how to box out. Look during the championship run, the Raptors had a stretch where they were so bad on the defensive glass that Nick Nurse was like, "We're going to do basic defensive rebounding drills sure, for like a yeah. couple of days." It was like a it was like a story for like a week mm. in Raptors land. I think it was pre trade deadline, um, so like when you're in January and looking for a story, um, it <laughs> yeah. was definitely something uh -huh. that that came up. I don't think I wrote about it, but people definitely wrote about. It. So this isn't like this isn't unique to the Raptors and, and the development situation. I guess my question for you would be: Was your read on that that we're at a point in the season where the Raptors are playing so many? They're not even the thing is they're playing guys that haven't played as much, but they're not playing like inexperienced guys, right? Like like Jamias Ramsey has had a couple years in league. Jordan Wars in year at the end of year four of being like a full time rotation player. Um, was your sense that that's more of a getting back to basics for the Raptors side, or because my thought when you told me that earlier was, well, maybe he was like getting to the basics because it was the coach's open house, and maybe that's the kind of stuff that's helpful for. Um, young young coaches or less experienced coaches who are coming out to check this out? I thought a similar thing in terms of like, are they sort of like going through this exercise for the coaches? But I actually think that this is something Darko has found necessary with the Raptors uh, as is. And that's actually something that I asked Darko about uh, afterwards um, when the practice was over. So let's actually run the clip so Darko can explain why he was running box out drills. Thank you for noticing that, uh, because uh, a lot of people would think, okay, you're in NBA, you're doing something uh, out of this world, you know. Um, one of the first calls that I got when I got hired as a head coach was uh, from Coach Pop, and we had a long conversation, and uh, one thing that he kept saying is don't skip any steps. You know, and that, that, that's what I'm really trying to do with, uh, with our young team, not to skip any steps. And uh, if that means that we need to spend more time on the simple thing as uh, boxing out and technique and how to extend elbows and protect the ball, that's what we need to do. And at the end of the day, when basketball is, is about that, is about fundamentals. When you watch NBA finals and uh, seven game series, there are no play that you cannot scout and take away. But what you cannot really scout and take away is individual strengths and fundamentals of the players. And it really comes that uh, down to that on both ends of the floor. So, yeah, that's what's necessary, working on basic drills. And, and there was a lot of them, I'm telling you. Though. Practice. Was, and we're talking about boxing out. We're talking about um, even just, like, who to take who on box outs. We're talking about, again, like, rotation and verticality they like split the players into two sessions at one point and they had you know starters on one side bench on one side and one side was practicing boxing and the other side was practicing just like closing out and being vertical at the rim against like assistant coaches basically trying yeah. to drop to the hoop like like when you say that you mean like you're not initially in position the paint how yeah. do you recover to the paint and then maintain verticality yeah. without kind of sliding to the side and using your yeah, yeah, yeah. that hip on hip foul kind of thing exactly okay. exactly things like that um, and, they, and you know what? They they did this for like at least like 20 minutes. Um, and I, I feel like especially considering because um, a, a lot of the questions I was going to ask Darko about was actually about just how do you improve the defense? Like I'm, I'm actually really happy to see that they were working on the defense. And yeah, I don't know. I mean, that might be a question to you, Blake. Just like, do you see a, a lack of fundamentals on the Raptors in particular? Yeah, I do. And, and, you know, fundamentals, I know sometimes people tend to think of that as like, oh, well, you're using the, the backboard for a mid-range shot. But like Tim Duncan being the big fundamental. Mm -hmm. No, we're talking about taking care of the little things, right? And it's obviously, look, the Raptors are not going to beat that, that game the other night against the Denver Nuggets, for example, where the Raptors played spirited basketball. And then by the fourth quarter, the Nuggets were just like, 
we're the Denver Nuggets, man. <laughs> like doing yeah. the little uh-huh. things and picking up the fundamentals is not going to change that game too much, probably. But on a game a couple nights later where the game against Detroit follows mm-hmm. that exact same script where Detroit's able to just pull away from you. Yeah. Well, if you play a more fundamentally sound game in that game, maybe you're in a, in a position where it's too big a lead for Detroit to come back, or they just don't, be, they're not able to find that gear against you to pull away late. Mm-hmm. And some of that is, yeah, some of it is boxing out and defensive rebounding. And this hasn't been a particularly great year for them defensive rebounding wise. Um, but uh, like the thing that stands out to me, and I've actually been harping on this since I think like day one of the season when the personnel was much better and the expectations were higher this has been a really bad transition defense team. Mm -hmm. And that is something that at the start of the year was really, really frustrating because it's, hey, everyone's huge and we're switchable and we've been a good transition defense in the past. And part of the idea of Vision 6-9 and having guys who are the same size as everywhere is we should be better able to play transition defense because anyone can guard anyone. You don't have to worry about getting confused, cross-matching and picking up your guy and things like that. Well, what we're seeing now is a far less experienced team and a team that can't rely on that switchability and anyone can guard anyone. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing is a lot of mistakes with like whose man is who, Hey, I'm the first man back is my primary, like what is my nine one one? Is it the rim? Mm -hmm. Is it the ball? When do I switch back to my guy? If I pick up the guy who's running to the paint first and then Kelly Olynyk gets back in time to tag me out of that, where do I go? Who's my, am I out to the corner? Am I a second on the ball? That's the kind of stuff where the Raptors have done a really, really poor job. And you expect that from a rebuilding team. For, like, I expect Grady Dick to make those mistakes. I yeah, expect Javon yeah, Freeman sure. Liberty and Jamias Ramsey, who both got assigned to the 905 for tonight, by the way. So if okay. you're looking for something to do on a Tuesday night, it's a pretty good NBA slate tonight, but there's also a 905 game. Yeah. They're fourth to last game of the season. Uh, so we'll get a look at them. But those guys, yes, I expect those transition defense mistakes to come up. Grady Dick you know, picking up the the guy who is doing the lane fill in transition and then you, hey, you stop that and then the big gets back in time and you get a little confused or a little lost on, hey, who's my guy? Where did he go? Or someone else helped over here, so I've got to X out to their man instead. Mm-hmm. I expect those things from some of the younger developing, developing guys and that's why I, I really understand the practice scheme like this. I, I know yeah. some people roll their eyes at like, you're an NBA team practicing box outs. But it's not just about that. It's like, yeah. how and when do you make those rotations and make them, mm-hmm. you know, the verticality point? How do you make that rotation and not just make the rotation, but make it in a way where it's actually effective? Yeah. How do you close out on a guy where it's not just, hey, that's my assignment to close out on it, but you're thinking more, more intently about how do I close out on this guy and close up properly and make sure that if that pass goes here or he drives here, that I'm ready to make the next play on that as well. Mm-hmm. The possession doesn't end like a drill ends when I make that closeout. So right, I'm not right, surprised right. to hear they're doing a lot of that. I think, you know, they have a Dude, long, long to. way to go defensively. They, yeah, they need um, this. I mean, again, like the stats are that the second worst events in the league since December 1st. Really? Yeah. Oof. Since December 1st. So that's like more than three months Ooh. of the season. They've been the second worst <laughs> defense. Uh, originally, uh, it was Detroit below them uh, as the Washington 30th. last now and now it's like Utah's last Interesting. But, but in any case um yeah they can use all the help that they can get I I, I, I thought it was important I do I honestly do so that that's since <laughs> December 1st that's since December 1st okay. um but in any case yeah they, they were also working on and this is something that Garrett was talking about where when he came on the program last week he actually explained that the Raptors change their defensive coverage, especially on pick and rolls, which obviously is the primary play that they're guarding against most times. Garrett explained that basically around the time when Jakob went down, and obviously Jakob and Scotty both went down roughly at the same time, so you really need to change your personnel when your only two good defenders are out. Um, But he explained that the Raptors, when they had Jakob, were funneling a lot of their action towards the middle and allowing Jakob to really contest and, and close out and just really be a big factor defensively without him and especially in the current state where they have kelly who's playing out of position at five basically no backups either. i didn't see jante out there which is a little strange but in any case although maybe so so i, I mentioned earlier javon yeah. and uh and jamias are going down to the 905 teams don't actually have to announce if their two ways are going down so it's possible jante's just with the 905 it, today it could as be, well could be although I'll they did have by the break they had muhammadu and guys like that with the team today but oh, in okay. any case then yeah um yeah, Garrett explained that now they're weaking on a lot of pick and rolls. So um, we got to actually see that in action as well. It was actually just really cool to sort of see them even just use defensive personnel and like the play calls and things like that just to sort of understand a little bit of the language. 
Um, but in any case, can you explain, well, first off, why are they doing this, Blake? And also, do you think this will help them improve, at least defensively, based on what they currently have, to change their coverage, basically, from forcing things middle to now forcing things to the side? Yeah, I mean, look, it, it's over time, you're going to have to get these guys comfortable playing all of these ways. We heard Darko earlier in the year talk about, you know, developmentally, maybe you're going to leave a guy on an island one-on-one -on -one more than you would otherwise because it's more important to get those reps one-on-one. -on -one. So I, okay. I don't really right. care that much about, like, what's actually going to be effective. Mm. I care about are you playing in a way and are you getting guys reps in ways that are going to matter later. Look, I think if you are a worse defensive team, mm -hmm. um, it is more dangerous to have a, even if you understand the system and you have the drop coverage and you're, you know, you're, you're pinching at the nails and stuff like that. If you are equipped and everyone under, you can understand why a team is okay sending a guy middle because it's, you know, in the modern NBA with so much spacing, it's, at, it's maybe a little easier to help middle mm -hmm. or, or dig in fr from, you know, the opposite elbow middle and things like that. The worse your defense is, the riskier it is to let a guy go middle, even if that's the plan, right? Like right, right. if you, if you are letting a guy go or nudging a guy to go middle and Kawhi Leonard is defending him and you're sending him middle against Marcus Hall as the help, that is a lot different yeah, sure. than even like Ochai's the primary defender and you're, and you're guiding him toward Jonte Porter. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, and that's no disrespect to those guys. It's just the better your defenders are, the more you can be aggressive with schemes and let guys get to higher danger areas yeah. because you're comfortable defending there or forcing turnovers or whatever. So I understand this. I, I generally think the more developmental a team is, probably the more base level you're going to skew their defense. Now, I don't want that long term. Like mm -hmm. if the Raptors come out next year and, and they're playing like a pretty conservative and, and like developmental focused defense, I might be a little bit of like, okay, well, you have Scotty Barnes back in and you have – Yaka yeah, back and sure. like RJ yeah. and Emmanuel quickly should be able to defend at NBA levels and stuff like that. I don't think it's a long term thing, but mm -hmm. you're in triage mode right now where like you're just trying to make sure you don't yeah. get run off the floor yeah. and that these games stay close enough that the reps matter. I I'm cool with it. I, I don't think it's a long term solution, right. but for right now with the personnel that they have, um, certainly too, as you're working more guys in, it's coverage that they'll be more familiar with and easier to probably execute as a, as a less experienced guy in the system. For sure. I, I do wonder, especially watching this us today, I was like, I wonder if the, the veteran players, like, they're like, we're practicing box outs, right? But, I mean, at the same time, like, some of these other guys really do need it. Some of the newer guys. That just struck me how often Darko would stop to practice and actually jump in himself. So, things where he would stop to practice and, like, a, again, not on the box out drill, but in, like, let's say they're, they're practicing defensive rotations and he would actually blow the whistle and jump into play and actually showcase, like, I want you to when you come up on the switch here, I want you to get really close, get really tight, pressure the ball, make him turn his back so they can't see the rest of the court instead of just like, you know, a couple of possessions where guys were kind of forgetting to do that and like just kind of switching and, you know, standing off. Again, it's practice against assistant coaches with a whole bunch of coaches in the stands. So you <laughs> might start to forget a little bit of the intensity that you need to play with, but it was actually interesting to see him jump in. That's about as much as I can really say about this. I'm, I'm actually really happy that the Raptors put this on as an organization. It's yeah. just really cool to be able to train the next generation of coaches. And there's always a Q&A afterwards. Um, the UFT women's team was there too. Um, you know, so yeah, shout out to Tamara and our team and, and, and coach John Bennett. Yeah, <laughs> JB. Yeah, he was there. Uh, you know, the girls got to play a little bit with uh, the players that they just shoot around a little bit nice. too. So th it's, it's just a really good community-focused event more than anything yeah, else. Yeah, it's great. And yeah. like, look, as a Canadian basketball community, one of the things we still need to continue to work on, we've seen this big explosion in Canadian basketball talent and enrollment at the youth levels and stuff like that. Um, the bigger the sport grows, the more you need those coaches, right? You mm -hmm. need to continue developing the coaching pipeline as well. And that's a, you know, a Canada-wide thing and a province-wide thing and, and each uh, region thing. But these th this type of thing helps because yeah. not only do these coaches get to go, um, you know, I, I would hope, look, there's a competitive element, but I would hope those coaches are going back and when they talk to other coaches in their leagues or, or their districts or whatever, you know, some of that stuff continues to get passed down. Mm -hmm. Not that the Raptors are like revealing stuff that is going to fundamentally change the way, oh, but, you know, this OUA right. team's playing or whatever, but it's, it's helpful experience. And the more you can bring coaches at any level up the more it's going to just continue to help kind of this snowball of canadian basketball talent for sure there was another thing that you got to ask about <laughs> at practice today uh as well oh man as people probably know 
Grady Dick did a, a little jersey swap with his boy Anthony Black after the the Magic game yeah. the other night. Um, there was a funny jersey swap thing last night uh, in the league as well, which we'll get to maybe in around the NBA with, okay. with Anthony Edwards. I bet it wasn't as funny as this one, though. It wasn't, although <laughs> it, it, people thought it was and then misunderstood it. Um, oh, okay, gotcha, but gotcha. I'll just say it now. So Anthony Edwards uh, obviously obliterated John Collins oh, yes. on a dunk yeah, last yeah, night, right, right. and a fan asked him for his jersey after the game when he was signing autographs and stuff, and he said, no, I got to give it to Colin, meaning Colin Sexton, because they're boys from back in mm. Georgia. Okay, okay, um, okay. But people thought he said Collins, like he was going to go give his jersey to the guy he just yammed on, Yo. which would be an all-time good <laughs> chirp after. You would totally believe it from a guy like Anthony Edwards, too, because yes. he has that type of personality, but... Oh, he also live commentated his own dunk when they showed it to him. I with saw the that. sideline reporter yeah. after <laughs> calling a six foot nine guy you just dunked all over too small in different words is pretty funny. Anyway, what a um, you, you asked Grady Dick about the uh, the jersey sure. swap with Anthony Black. Yeah, um, let's let's see, let's hear the video. Let's hear why Grady did this. Grady, we got to ask you about the um, the jersey swap the other day. Um, <laughs> why did you choose to to swap jerseys with Anthony Black? That's my guy. Yeah, no, I, I've, been, I've been playing with him since or against him and with him, you know, around middle school days. Okay. So that's been my guy for a long time. And, mm. You know, guys jersey swap with their boys. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my my friend. Do you have other jersey swaps planned in the future? Or? If I play with them growing up and they're my, they're my guys, then I'll jersey swap with them. Gotcha. Nothing more to it. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Nothing more to it. Other than the giant smile on his face when you first asked. <laughs> it was really funny because um, going in, because, yeah, we, we, we figured out, like, I don't know, five minutes before that, like, it was going to be Ochai and Grady that were going to speak at the podium. So coach spoke first, then uh, Ochai came in and Grady came in. Of course, like, this is all basketball questions. But when Grady came in, I think uh, I turned around to one of the other reporters and I was like, who's going to ask him the, 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 the question? And they said you were. And then they were like, I was like, no, 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 don't worry. Like, I feel like, you know, someone else in the room may ask this. So hopefully it's not one of us. But then you, you get to feel that, like, okay, the scrum is starting to die off. Like, you know, like, it feels like, you can always tell when people have a question because they're kind of eager to jump in. And there was nobody jumping in for a second. And I was like, oh, man, I'm going to have to take this bullet. So, yeah, I asked the question. Um, do you buy it at all? I don't believe it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> look, we saw the – you can do the lip reading. They knew they were doing something funny yes, and stood did. the way that they did. Um, it's fine. Look, I think if you – if that is your surname – and you're going, and he's talked about he was subject to like jokes and and chirping from other fan bases and stuff in college sure. and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. You got to own it and have some fun with it. I, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's uh. He's a goofy little kid. He really is. Yeah, I yeah. wouldn't call him a little kid, but yeah, he's a goofy guy. He's definitely he's definitely a little goofy. But I, I actually really enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah, I actually really enjoyed that. Grady stuck to his uh, stuck to his guns on that one. You know, but um, I hope I properly conveyed the skepticism that everybody. Yeah, had in his answer. That's yeah. All. yeah, it's uh. That's what happens when I go down to practice, man? This is this is what happens. We 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 got a full report on practice, and then we get to your Grady, you know, lie. <laughs> Uh, all right. Uh, the practice report is good though, because we don't get to we don't get that good a window into what sure. happens yeah, in practice sure, all sure. that often. Yeah. We also over the years have not gotten that good a window into like we've seen a lot of Kyle Lowry. We've both been oh, chirped yeah. by Kyle Lowry. We've been oh, dapped yeah. up by Kyle Lowry. Mm. We know all the Kyle Lowry stories, but it hasn't been all that often that Kyle Lowry speaks openly about himself and lets other people speak openly about him. James right. Herbert got the the curtain drawn back in a really great piece at CBS Sports. Yeah, if you haven't read it already, you 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 have the next five minutes because we're gonna bring in James Herbert to 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 talk about it. But it's up on CBS Sports uh, and. Any chance we get to talk about Kyle Lowry and not about Raptors practice, we're going to do it. So we're going to take that break. I've been your host, Willow. You've been listening to The Raptors Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soup. Welcome back to The Raptors Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. I'm your host, Willow, joined by co-host Blake Murphy. We're also joined by a friend of the program, James Herbert, CBS Sports, James Herbert, 11 herbs and spices no no games today actually just just straight reporting from the man who wrote yet another excellent feature on Kyle Lowry. James how you doing I am doing great thank you guys for having me always always uh we are also eagerly awaiting the results of the Olympic draw which uh have been already dragging its feet and, and taking its time because later on we will be able to talk about that with a member of Team Canada I guess I'll just keep that quiet for now but in any case um 
Yeah, the draw, by the way, is like it, it started at two o'clock. It's now two thirty, and all we've seen basically is they did an Olympic Mello mixtape because Mello's Great. there as like one of the ambassadors. Awesome. Um, but yeah. We'll find that out shortly. Yeah. Well, in the meantime, um, you wrote a great piece about Kyle Lowry uh, up on CBS Sports uh, and how he's transitioning over to, um, you know, playing now in his hometown of Philadelphia with the Sixers. And you actually began this really interestingly because when Kyle got traded to Charlotte, he was obviously never going to play uh, for Charlotte. It was just a question of which team he was going to latch on with. And I think when we were here discussing about ideas, I think obviously Philadelphia was an option because that was the hometown team and they obviously needed somebody. But also New York could have been an interesting option. I think Blake was really pushing that idea of like going over to Team Villanova, basically, which is what the Knicks are. Um, and you got confirmation that, yeah, there was at least a, an attempt from members of the Knicks to try to get Kyle to come over there. Yeah, Josh Hart is the one who gave the confirmation about trying to recruit him. He said some words that I like literally can't say <laughs> on this show about his effort to get Kyle to come mm -hmm. um, sign with the Knicks. You know, those guys go back a long time. Um, he knows all those Villanova guys. Um, but I think it also just would have been a good fit because Tibbs is somebody who has always spoken glowingly about Kyle Lowry, just kind of for obvious reasons, right? Like a really tough... Um, smart, just a just a guy who you can trust on both ends of the floor to execute things and in a way that would keep the coaching staff happy. Just another sort of coach on the floor, also a super tough guy that just plays super duper hard. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if Philadelphia didn't exist, like I wouldn't have been surprised at all if he went to New York. But I, I think this was sort of telegraphed like to to go to his hometown team at this stage of his career um be another ball handler be another floor spacer um, a guy that can sort of help tyrese maxi which i talked to him about like that was sort of the number one option but yeah i mean of course uh, the knicks were interested and josh hart tried to make it happen but it didn't work how unsurprised were you when josh hart gives you the anecdote that led your piece where it's like, oh, yeah, Kyle Lowry went to Villanova runs in the offseason, was hacking freshmen at Villanova. Like, there, there are obviously, like, a lot of, like, typical Kyle Lowryisms in that story you wrote. <laughs> but leading off with that one, I was like, yeah, uh, of course Kyle's going back and busting these guys who are nobody yet. Um, man, and between that and, and, I guess, Paul Reed relating to Kyle through, like, oh, what I could do with him back in 2K – uh, back in the day, I don't know, man. They, they, I, I'm not even asking a question here. It's just like it's funny. Like I'm sure you expected some of these things as you were. Did anything catch you off guard in going through this, or or was it all just like, yeah, that's very Kyle. I'm glad to get confirmation here, another anecdote. But Kyle's Kyle. I'm not sure anything shocked me. I will say the Paul Reed 2K thing just kind of came out of nowhere. Like, I, I wasn't, like, asking him a question about, you know, watching Kyle when he was younger. I didn't set him up in any way um, to start talking about 2K. I, it was just sort of a general broad question about Kyle and, like, his leadership and what, what he's bringing to the team and that sort of deal. And in the middle of his answer, just as an aside, Paul Reed starts talking about how he used to get buckets with him in 2K. I just thought that was perfect. I, I just, uh, Paul Reed's a hilarious guy. Like, I would love to write a big in-depth thing on him one day. Um, now is not exactly that time, but may maybe it'll happen. We just got to get Mo Bamba out of the way. This uh, this is unbelievable. We, I don't mean to turn this into a Nick Nurse decision-making thing, but Nick uh, Nurse yeah. wearing the out-the-mud hoodie as he benches Paul Reed for Mo Bamba is uh, mixed messages, James. Buddy, they, they need scoring. They need scoring very badly. And at least if you bring Paul off the bench, you bring in some scoring. And yeah, because uh, a lot of Sixers games are coming out of defense. And I think, you know, especially because these Sixers games have been so grimy, all right, without Embiid, um, you get to really, the more grimy the game is, the more you get to appreciate what Kyle Lowry does to contribute towards the game being grimy. And I think, especially for anyone in Toronto, when you, or thinking about Kyle Lowry, like, none of that stuff will surprise you. Like, you know this. It's fundamental to you. It's, like, inked into your brain of, of the little shenanigans that Kyle Lowry likes to do. But I actually really enjoy when you kind of outline your, his teammates realizing, like, oh, like, this is what he does, and this, this, this is why it's really smart. So ta ta walk me through his teammates realizing why Kyle Lowry is uh, the little genius that he is. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. I didn't want to overdo like just a bunch of similar quotes. Like I have a quote in there from Mo Bamba talking about how, you know, I'm not sure it was even a direct quote, but like one of the reasons why um, 
people want to take direction from him, what people will fall in line from him is that they see how hard he plays and they respect that. But basically everybody I talked to about Kyle would talk about, you know, cause they would, they would talk about how he was very direct, how he would not be afraid to criticize people. He'll call people out like on the floor. He'll do it loudly. He'll do it quietly behind the scenes, whatever. Um, but he has, um, this credibility and the credibility comes from, yeah, of course, like he's a former champion. He's a, he used to be a perennial all-star. He's done just about everything you can do in the NBA, but it also comes from the fact that still at this stage of his career at six feet tall, he is in there taking charges. Like he took a charge against Zion um, okay, relatively right. recently. You, you yeah. see him diving on the floor last night. Like literally he like dives um, into the the Sixers PA announcer at, at home, and they interviewed the PA announcer later on the broadcast. This was him chasing um, a bad pass um, on the perimeter. Like he is always sacrificing his body. I think his fellow teammates all sort of appreciate that. You know, he's earned the right to call them out because look at what he's doing. And he's you know, for some of them, he's more than a decade. For most of them, he's more than a decade older than them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's crazy. And, and I mean, even last night, there were other ones last night. Like, obviously, there's the, there's the note in your PC already leads the 76ers in charges drawn. Um, last night, Nick Nurse tried to put in campaign at one point, and, Nick, and uh, Kyle told campaign to go back to the bench uh, late in that game. There, there's a lot of sure. things like that. So yeah. over the years, we've seen a lot of these Kyle Lowry things, right? Um, do you have a favorite or a small handful of favorites of, like, Kyle brain genius moments? Yeah, so one thing I really love that, that he does, he used to do it all the time. Um, when he's on a fast break, he'll do this sort of like almost a handoff or like a pass back to somebody mm -hmm. on the break while simultaneously setting like a semi-legal at best screen yeah. on whoever was back for the defense. Like that's how Kawhi got his big left-handed dunk in game six of the Eastern Conference Finals. Little that grab was an the amazing jersey. assist. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But that's the sort of thing Kyle would do constantly yep and the the cool thing about this brain genius stuff is like even now like even if he's only in the game for 20 minutes or whatever you can usually find multiple things in the same game that mm -hmm. he's doing like last night there was a sequence where um he was like the the help defender and he perfectly anticipated a, a pass he comes in gets an interception he pushes the ball down the floor and he notices there's a heat player that's still getting back in transition so he kind of gets in front of him and stops early and then when there's a little bit of contact kyle is down on the ground and that he has been doing stuff like that forever. There was an and one he got again, literally last night where he had leaked out on the break. Um, there was a, a defender who would try to get the steal and it ended up falling on the floor. Kyle could have just taken the straight line for an easy layup, but instead sort of like jumped backwards over the guy that was on the ground and oh, yeah. ended up getting an and one and out one, of it. Yeah. And yeah. And you can probably picture him doing that, that kind of thing in Toronto. Like he just, mm -hmm. he's always thinking a step ahead. He's always trying to, put the refs in a position where they have to blow the whistle. He's always, you know, e even just like little things about how he can test shots up with like two hands up like that to try to leverage all the length that he can muster, which is not that much at six feet tall, but you know, he does what he can. Yeah. I think that's the thing with Kyle is that like, he's, he's almost like an accountant in a way. He's just like going through like any sort of tiny fine margins, any technicality and trying to, you know, win that for his team. And, and, and that's the thing where it's like, Especially now, you see a lot of players starting to do things that Kyle used to do a long, long time ago. I'm not saying that Kyle was the first guy to figure out that you can roll the ball out and eat some of the clock before the shot clock. Walk the begins. dog. Yeah, right? But, like, you see that across the league now. Kyle used to do that a lot, even with just with the Raptors. Things that Kyle used to do, which was, like, the quick inbound. So he would, like, bring the ball over to the referee. Like, the ball, yes. the ball, the ball, the ball, yeah. And then get it back yeah. so that he can quickly inbound if he sees, a, a like, a you know, imbalance in the floor. Yeah. The other one, uh, the big one that I remember, and I didn't even know this was a rule until Kyle started doing it, but every point guard runs over half and goes to a hash mark to call yes. timeout. Yeah. And Kyle started doing it in the middle of the floor because then you have the choice which side of the floor right. you're going to inbound the ball on. And I think that goes back to game seven against the Nets when <laughs> they drew up the play on the wrong side of the floor uh, um, really? for that for that final bucket one. But there are so yeah. many like that. Honestly, the one I'm surprised he hasn't done is the one Jokic, uh, Jokic is doing all the time now, which is the fake shoelace tie to give your team more time oh, to decide yeah. if they want to yeah. challenge a play. But that's the thing when we're talking about like high basketball IQ is like Kyle is playing the opponent. He's playing. He's thinking for his teammates. He's thinking for the coaches. He's thinking for the officials. You know what I mean? Like it's it takes a he's, lot he's to do that. For the officials is a funny way to phrase it. No, there's just a lot of players that you <laughs> see like float out there. Sometimes they're not even thinking about what they're doing, let alone what their teammates are doing, what their help responsibilities are, what the opponent's trying to do to you. Kyle is the total opposite of it. And that's why he's like how he's like the fourth oldest player in the league now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like um him yeah. and him and Garrett Temple were like 
uh, roommates when they played at some sort of high school tournament. And Garrett Temple's Garrett Temple now, right? He's he's the vet. He sits on the bench and he he gives advice and things like that. And it comes on the Raptor show, which will happen on Thursday. Kyle's still in the game for like winning franchises. He was just in the finals, like. Yeah, I, I just can't, I can't, I can't appreciate Kyle enough. Thank you for writing this. Yeah, yeah, and James, look, we can talk about, you know, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing that the Sixers need him so much right now. It's probably, hey, they they won yesterday a, a very tough game, and uh, they've won some ugly ones with him. Um, one of the things that I, I think this kind of bridges, like, a talent thing and a physicality thing and a brain thing, but, like, one of the things that stands out with Kyle, and this is really helpful with the 76ers for Maxi right now with Embiid out, um, they haven't used it a ton, but you could do some Buddy Heald stuff with this, similar to how Tyrese used Buddy Heald. But Kyle's also one of the best screeners and maybe the best screener on every team he's played for the last little while. How much of that to you is the brain side of things? And obviously Kyle is like, you know, we know he's a stout post defender and stuff. He's a strong guy for his size. Um, but, you know, that ability for him to also open things up for the 76ers and his previous teams with his screening ability, you know, this, that to me is kind of a bridge skill. It's not, yeah, there's a brain element to it as well, but it also speaks to that he he's still giving a lot at the physical level as well. Yeah, I mean, some of it, I mean, I wish I had a little more time with him. Maybe I could have gotten into the, the screening side of things, but like, I imagine some of it might go back to all the, like the Villanova days when he's playing in he's like three or four guard lineups and Alan Ray. somebody to set mm. screens. Yeah, right. Like yeah. Um, he's always been a guy that is like, yeah, he's a point guard, but he's willing to do stuff that is associated with wings or is associated with bigs. He'll do whatever the team needs. He can be the star of the team. Like he was the best player in the Raptors for multiple years and he was still their best hustle guy and energy guy at the same time. Um, and screening I think is, is part of that. It's a thankless job. It's a, it's a thing that only nerds like us want to talk about. Um, but Kyle has always been really good at it. He knows how to use, um, his size, which, you know, he, we've been talking about it for years. Like oh, yeah. he is a stout dude who is really strong. You can't post him up and he sets really hard, solid screens. And the fact that he is also a very good three point shooter makes all that stuff way more powerful. Like that's the thing, like in, in healed and in Lowry, they have two guards. They do it differently, right? Like healed oftentimes is just ghosting the screen, not really making any contact, but just he is there. And then suddenly boom, he's at the three point line and the, and the shots are ready up. Like Kyle can do that, but he can also set a screen and just actually be that guy. Um, and that is why, I mean, I made a note in the piece, like they do seem like, like if, and when Embiid comes back, they will have a more diversified offense. I think um, they're arguably a more well-rounded team, even than they were last year where, you know, they were unanimously considered like title contenders and all of that. And they still had James Harden on the team. It's a bit of a different look now. Um, but I think between what Heald brings as a movement shooter, what Lowry brings as, you know, a screener, a movement shooter, a playmaker, all of these different things, um, what Batum brings as a connector and playmaker and versatile defender, and then the improvement that you've seen from Maxi, I think there is an argument like this is still like every bit as much a championship contender as it was last season um it's just we haven't seen Embiid in a while um and you can't really judge them off of how they've looked without Embiid I mean it's just yeah. it's been real tough they've been a bottom 10 team on both ends um when they are winning they're winning pretty ugly they're usually not beating playoff teams when they are even like you know like Jimmy was out last night when they beat the Knicks Brunson was out and the score was 79 73 um Fred Katz wrote a great game story on that which which I linked to which was just a long poop joke basically I loved it but it was a long poop joke and that's what that game deserved mm -hmm. um so th this is sort of where the Sixers are but yeah. I think at the same time we can't imagine where the Sixers might be when they are whole because you have to remember they're they're also missing D'Anthony Melton who was huge for them and they're missing Robert Covington who like if you can just have as many Covingtons and Batums as you can like that helps you get through a playoff series yeah Nick has a a lot of options if he wants to throw on players who will annoy the teams and it, it is also Nick's MO as as a coach too. and annoy refs Wow. Yeah. I mean, if they had briefly, I mean, I know they were obviously this is a done in conjunction, but they they got off of Pat Bever Beverly and they brought in Kyle. But it's like if they if they were somehow on the same team with Embiid and Nick Nurse as the head coach, I would have we would have needed to cancel the Philadelphia 76ers. And this team had James Harden not, not long ago. Like that was <laughs> yeah. earlier this year that James Harden was but there, too. The thing I would say that's different with Kyle is that like he he's campaigning 
And it, it comes from a place that I, I know sometimes he knows that he's lying, but like it, it's just a sheer will to win. Like for a guy who, again, used to be a star player, nothing was below Kyle either. You know I mean, like he will try to fight you. Like Aaron Gordon, I'll fight you. I'll meet you in the bubble. Yeah. <laughs> we both live here. I'll fight a neighbor essentially. But it's like he, he'll crawl under like George Hill's legs just <laughs> to get one call. You know what I mean? Like, and he didn't even get that call because obviously that's not a foul. Yeah. Like, no one's even, there's not even a rule in the book for that. But when the star player like that plays that hard, again, that goes back to why he's been able to instantly come in and click with people. It's like when a guy who with that kind of resume, who's made that much money in his, in his career with the championship ring, when he's willing to do all that, then everyone else has to fall in line. So, you know, Kyle's doing great. OG, another former Raptor. Every time he plays for the Knicks, he's awesome. And then he just goes out with injuries. Uh, unfortunately, he came back from, what, an elbow injury, but yeah. then he played a game. Now he's back out again. I mean, Woj provided the update. It seems like it's going to be a couple of games at least. I don't know. What do you see with the Knicks? I also did watch their game last night, and even without OG, that team scraps like <laughs> like crazy, and that's why they won against the Warriors. Yeah, they're a super hard playing team. They're like very much in the image of Thibodeau. I mean, they're also in the image of sort of Villanova, like like we talked about earlier. Right. Um, OG is the guy that makes them complete at this point. Like he just is. And even when they didn't have Mitchell Robinson, like what they did in January was incredible defensively. And that is with Hartenstein having, you know, an excellent year. Like I think even just for a starting center, never mind the fact that. Um, he was intended to be the backup center to Mitchell Robinson, like when he has been healthy and he's been battling back from some stuff mm. lately. Um, I think coming into form again now, though, um, but when he's been healthy, I mean, there were games where Thibodeau was playing him like 38, 40 minutes a game and he was giving them rim protection that was like about as good as they were they were getting with Robinson before. Um, the thing with OG is guard any position you usually just stick him on the best player but um as you know you saw in toronto for years like the raptors could play any kind of coverage and he would figure it out you could use him in multiple ways um there was a quote earlier um when the the pacers came to town somebody asked rick carlisle about um how do you sort of prepare for a defender like a defensive star like og and he compared og to Kawhi leonard back in the day and he said sometimes it's as simple as okay whoever he's on like you just park him away from the ball. You don't try to attack that guy. That changes your your game plan completely. Um, so clearly from the, from the defensive end, um, he enhances what's already a really, you know, a pretty versatile, pretty tough, pretty strong team. Um, but but I think what you really see offensively, they just they missed him so much. And um I think part of it is Bogdanovich has not fit in as well as they hoped. Um he has not played as much as most people thought that he would, I think, because they don't trust him defensively um but because og has been so good at attacking closeouts because he's been so good at just nailing threes um you can really feel it when he's not there um francis Achua has been great for the knicks but i think his best minutes have been at the five and when he's starting at the four the spacing is just not the same i mean the, yeah. the way that the sixers beat them that game um when brunson wasn't playing is they just completely ignored precious Achua on the perimeter they completely ignored wow. josh hart on the perimeter and they packed the paint like crazy and when OG's in the corner, like you, you have to guard him. Mm -hmm. And he's he's been the guy that just connects all the other pieces for them. So if he's there, I feel really good about them, kind of regardless of what they get from Randall, what they get from Robinson um, the rest of the year. Um, but if he's not there, there's just kind of a ceiling. Like they just have to win ugly, really. It is very funny that Nick Nurse just completely knew the scout here for it on Precious. <laughs> he's like, if we leave him alone, he won't score, even though, even if we do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so James, there are some injury caveats there with the Sixers. There are some injury yeah. caveats there with the New York Knicks. There are injury caveats with the Cleveland Cavaliers, who won a, a really close, tough game against Indiana last night without Donovan Mitchell and Evan Mobley. Donovan Mitchell going to miss a little bit of time here with a, with a facial fracture. Um, how are we sizing up the Eastern Conference right now? Obviously, Boston as a regular season team is the clear number one, and then there's a, a big kind of mess after that. Uh, injury caveats acknowledged. How do you kind of rank this this Eastern Conference out right now? So I did a power rankings, but it's not really in terms of like what we're necessarily going to see in the playoffs. Like I did a power rankings based on what we're seeing right now. And it's funny, like it's just kind of dark for a lot of these teams. Like I have Boston number one for like screamingly obvious reasons and then a pretty big drop off. Um, then I'd have Milwaukee squarely at number two and then another decent drop off. And then I'd have the Knicks at number three. 
the Cavs at number four. Um, and then the Cavs are even like still like they are in a much different place than they were going into the all-star break. They've been kind of iffy since then. Um, they're dealing with multiple injuries right now. I mean, it was nice to see them pull that game out without Mitchell. Um, but it's kind of weird. Like you were seeing like Marcus Morris come in and hit four threes off the bench for them to win that game. Like Tristan Thompson just came back from, from his suspension, which is good news for them. But also like, I'm just sort of watching these bench units and I'm like, what, what am I actually watching here right now? Um, but at full strength, we saw what they could do. They were amazing for like more than two months of the season. Um, that's, that's my top four. Um, after that, it's kind of like nobody playing that well, like the heat, I have a number five. If we did this two weeks ago, we'd be saying a whole bunch of nice things about them, but it's been kind of rough. They had a terrible loss to Washington. Um, obviously they lose to Philly last night. Duncan Robinson, we see today. Um, he's going to be, he's going to probably miss some time. He'd left last night's game in the third quarter because of a back issue, which is always scary. Don't feel great about the Pacers, but I have them at number six. Um, the magic have had a soft schedule and they've had a couple of rough losses, um, to the Pacers, to the Knicks, who I who I have in front of them. And then I have Sixers at number eight because look, I it's been ugly. I'm I'm power ranking things like right now without Embiid, without Melton, without Covington. Uh, they have not got many like great wins. Um, they're just having to work so hard for everything they can get offensively. There's a ton on Maxi's shoulders. Um, and as Blake alluded to earlier, there's this Mo Bamba versus Paul Reed controversy which if, if that's what like i'm hearing on the right Ricky sanchez like it's 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 a rough time man it's kind of dark it is uh it's a mid-conference let's be honest the west is uh is, is a lot more talented and a lot more thrilling but i mean you never know um james we appreciate you all right thanks for coming to program as always and um yeah i don't know we got to get you back on to do a draft or like some sort of like trivia game or something you know what i mean like that's typically what you do but the the main job of what you do is is write excellent features so go out there and write that b-ball paul feature okay get get i want to know more about a man whose nickname is basketball um yeah I, fingers crossed if it's nick's sixers in the playoffs and i get to to cover the sixers a little bit more i will like i'm all in on that. that that would be so much fun thank you guys so much for having me on again and of course i'll play any game any game that you, you guys want to play there you go james herbert of cbs sports um a lot of talk of former Raptors point guard Kyle Lowry on the program. Got me thinking a lot about this commercial that he used to be on. Kyle Lowry! Why, man? <laughs> so, okay, what? Okay, we have a minute here before break, and you know we talked a bunch of Kyle Lowry as we can. Um, what do you make of this trend now where these commercials are basically just designed to annoy you as much as possible so they stick in your mind? Like that Kyle Lowry commercial. Kyle! <laughs> like oh my god it's so loud uh or like the the whopper one state commercial which plays i think 86 times for a raptor game yeah and that one is just uh like a bad family guy joke turned into a commercial oh i didn't even know the origin yeah. okay all right um it's uh i think anyway yeah and it's annoying yeah i don't know uh, i guess like as commercials uh -huh. you're just trying to cut through all the noise but it's uh it's not great anyway we have uh, olympic groups that we can do yeah. after the break, which okay. is really exciting. Awesome. Uh, awesome. Not not that great on the women's side. It's going to be tough. The it's men, tough. the yeah. men maybe got something close to a not a best case, but mm. it's uh you avoided the USA and Serbia in the same group, so uh, yeah, sounds, good, good luck to those guys. That sounds pretty good. Okay, we will we'll take that break then, and so that way you can let me know and we can react to those Olympic groups after the draw was finally held after 53 minutes um, since the event took place, but. Uh, yeah, appreciate James for coming on the program, and we're going to take another break. I've been your host, Walu. You've been listening to The Raptors Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soup. Welcome back to The Raptors Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network. I'm your host, William Lou. continue to be joined by co-host Blake Murphy. Uh, as we teased before the break, the Olympic pools have been drawn for both the women's and the men's teams. Canada, obviously... Or the first time since 2000, we'll have both teams at the uh, Olympics uh, this upcoming summer in Paris. Blake, tell us about the groups. Yeah, I can absolutely do that. Uh, we got to see for half an hour Carmelo Anthony going like this and dishes of like three little plastic balls, little Pokemon balls that he had to open. Uh, okay, so <laughs> uh -huh. on the women's side, Canada is ranked fifth in the world. Mm -hmm. They have drawn into a pool with Australia, who are ranked third, France, who are ranked seventh, 
and Nigeria, who are ranked 12th. Mm. So this is okay. not, you know, you're on ranking. You're the second of the four teams. That's a positive, but France is right behind you. You have three, five, seven in your group. And look, the thing with any of these Olympic formats is going to be, it's only a 12 team tournament. There are no soft spots. Um, it's not like the World Cup where there are 32 teams and you could potentially end up in a weak group. There, there are no weak groups uh, at this point. If you're the Canadian women, you're probably okay with this. Obviously, with the geographic principles, you weren't very likely to end up close to the USA anyway. Yeah. Um, you avoid that. You avoid China, who are the number two ranked that's uh, right. Women's who knew? program. Who knew? So, yeah. you know, in terms of who is the one seed in your group, if that's the primary thing you're worried about, avoiding the U.S. and China in favor of Australia is maybe a positive. I'm personally of the mind that Australia has not put their best possible lineup out there the last few events, and there's a little bit more upside in the, in the Australian team there. Um, and then you look at, you know, that second wave. France is probably a, a better draw as the number two team in your league than in your pool than Spain. Technically, Canada is the number two team in yeah, the pool. Sure. Um, but, you know, there's still a scenario where you could have ended up with it with Spain. And we just saw Spain uh, in that in those qualifiers. Mm -hmm. So Close we know game. they're Close we know game. they're a little bit uh, a little bit tough. So I, I don't know. There's um, and, and full disclosure, I don't I don't know teams like Puerto Rico and Nigeria, um, you know, the depth and quality of their programs quite as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think you came out of this OK. Hey, game. Yeah, OK on the women's side. Um, yeah. Nothing, uh, you know, you're certainly not celebrating, but you also didn't get anything that appears to be, you know, group of death worthy. Yeah, yeah. the most important thing is you avoid USA, who are obviously the, the huge heavy favorites to win. What about on the men's side? Yeah, the men's side is, uh, it's kind of a big wait and see. So you, at least, again, because of the geographic principles, you weren't going to be in the same pool as the U.S. So the first thing you're looking at is, well, who do you who are you worried most about? If we assume everyone's going to play, you probably want to avoid Serbia, right? Serbia lands in a pool with the USA. Mm. And mm. that pool also, also has South Sudan. And potentially, like if we're, if we're going on, you know, who I think is coming out of the Olympic qualifiers, Lithuania. So that's a pool with okay. the U.S., Serbia, and Lithuania. It's a lot of size, and that was mainly, well, that's one of U.S.'s many problems was size. Yeah, Yeah. so that's an interesting pool. Canada, instead, yep. uh, lands in a pool here with, um, why did I why, why did I lose it? Um, so they're in with Australia as well. Okay. So that is the number five ranked program. They have declined a little bit over the last uh, yeah. the last little while. They're, they're right. not quite the level that, you know, we saw at the peak of that Australian program, you know, peak Patty Mills and stuff like that, mm. but still a, a team that very much needs to be uh, respected and, and will be difficult and a team yeah. that usually has some pretty good size mm -hmm. as well. And then where Canada has the two question marks is they will play two of the Olympic qualifying tournament winners. So, okay, if so you, that's still TBD. Yeah, yeah so those, those take place in early July, just before Summer League. Um, so if you remember... And you do because Canada has been through this a lot. Oh, yeah. How difficult and how loaded some of those tournaments can be. Uh, it's difficult. So the first one is the team that will come out of the Spain Olympic qualifying tournament. That tournament includes Spain, who obviously yeah. we, we know the, the quality of that program. Canada's played some tough games against them recently, yeah. as recently as the World Cup. Uh, and they're the host team. So maybe you think they're the favorite. Well, that tournament also has Finland in it, who are okay. a pretty good team okay. and have big shotgun. Uh, leading the way and maybe the most interesting team in any of these olympic qualifying tournaments is the bahamas who loaded up yeah, with, with right. uh, a, a handful yeah a handful of um, uh, um kind of guys we would think of as american traditionally but buddy healed eric, eric gordon, gordon yeah. uh, deandre ayton so uh right, right, right i don't know we'll see which deandre ayton shows up um <laughs> but they have some guys there yeah, and, and they yeah. had they like like destroyed everyone in the pre-Olympic qualifying tournament uh, to get to this point. So that'll be an interesting one. Angola, Lebanon, and Poland also involved in those qualifiers. Right, right. Um, the other one we will be keeping an eye on is the one in Greece. Okay. And that is a deep field. So maybe there's not a team you're as worried about as Spain, mm. but that one has Greece as the host. The Dominican Republic are also in that tournament who, you know, we know ha have an upside, especially if Cap plays for them. They, beat, um, they actually beat Canada last year in one of the warm-up games. Yes. Um, yeah. um, they're a pretty good team with a, a good history there. Um, Egypt is in there as well, a team that always brings some good size. And then in the other pool there, Slovenia and Croatia oh, and great. New Zealand. New Zealand, you know, not, not yeah, much I mean, of a, a threat historically. But Slovenia, Croatia, and Greece, as well as the Dominican, all in that qualifier. So right. um, 
obviously we have seen what a Croatian team can look like at its peak. We've mm -hmm. seen what a Slovenian team can look like uh, when they really get their best guys out there. Mm -hmm. um, so Canada's in this spot where you're probably happy with Australia being the best team in your group. That That's probably on the, the better end of the outcomes, but you could end up with Spain or that loaded that, you know, that Bahamas team that loaded is yeah. not the right word, but I'd imagine they're going to try to get more guys out for that. Um, it, now that they have the momentum and they're in that Olympic qualifier, yeah. then you're looking at maybe Slovenia, maybe Croatia, maybe Greece, t team programs that, you know, we know the European program could have more Olympic teams um, if, it, if it was an open format instead of a regional format. So, um, yeah, this isn't going to be easy, man, but it shouldn't be because it's the Olympics. No, I mean, I, I think this is just really excited to be, like, seeing both teams involved in this. I know the women's have always been here, but I think for the men's side, all the excitement building off of last summer, you would hope that momentum continues. Um, by the way, Clay is, his father is uh, Bahamanian. Mm. So he could also be joining the Bahamas. He actually gave a quote um, at the start of training camp this year uh, that he would seriously consider playing for the Bahamas. Now, I, I, he's already won a gold medal with, with USA. So I'm like, all right, this is rude. But I mean, obviously, US is not going to take him for this uh, Olympic run. But in any case, yeah, it'll, it'll be a difficult run because you're, you're basically telling me that the, Rap or the Raptors, that Canada could potentially see... Uh, depending on how the group shake up, one of Giannis or Luca. Yep. With Greece or Slovenia. So yep. it's not um, even easy. But then again, they already did beat Slovenia once. By the way, uh, Kai yeah. Jones, another guy who's back in the NBA now with the Sixers, who's yeah. played for Bahamas. And uh, apparently, according to an article from this past summer, after Bahamas reached this stage, mm -hmm. Evan Mobley, Isaiah Mobley, Naz Reed, and Clay Thompson what? are all okay. possible, all right. are all players who like, obviously right. you have to go through the process right. uh, of reclassifying and stuff uh -huh. like that. But those are all players who could theoretically uh, play for the Bahamas. If wow. I, I mean, Evan Mobley's probably at the level where it's like, well, I could possibly play for the U.S., so I'm not going to mm. reclass. But you add Naz Reed and even Isaiah Mobley, who's like a really nice G League player. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah this is uh, this is the thing. You like the World Cup is always like once you get out of the initial group stage, and Canada obviously in 2019 had the quote unquote group of death with Australia and Lithuania in there, oh, yeah. and they just they didn't have the turnout they hoped for anyway. Right. But like we saw in this past World Cup, once you get out of that group stage, there's no easy spots in a 32 team oh. tournament. Now you're compressing that 32 down to 12 teams, mm -hmm. and all of those teams have had to qualify to get there through the World Cup or through yeah. these Olympic qualifiers. There are no soft spots, and it's, it makes it an incredibly exciting tournament, yeah. but it does make it hard on a day like today when the draw comes out to feel any kind of good about it because oh. you're you're playing, th you're, you're in a four-team group with three, no matter who wins those tournaments, three very good teams. The thing is, it's fun. we're worried about them, but they're more worried about us. Yes. That's the part that's really cool because yes. I know nobody's looking forward to seeing Canada. In, in basketball anytime soon. No, absolutely not. And Canada has, you know, Canada's reached a point too where we're talking about some of these programs and the the headline guy you'd be worried about going up against. And Canada has that in Shea Gilgis-Alexander who yeah. could potentially be the NBA MVP this year and yeah. had a case as the World Cup MVP last tournament. Had a great case um, for it, yeah. Shouts to Dennis, though, but, for winning it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but Canada also has depth to this program. Not that those other countries don't, but, like, we're talking about a core seven NBA guys from yeah. that team who all have their contract status taken care of for this summer already. Right. We're talking about young guys around the league who have put their hand up and say, I want to play, I want to coach Shane Sharp, Andrew Nembhard, guys like that who would like to be there, who could potentially fortify the depth. We've heard a guy like Wiggins would love to come back in the mix and stuff like that. Now, we'll see. He's obviously dealt with a lot of personal stuff, and we'll see how, what all the playoffs and, and injuries and things like that that shake out but canada's in a in a good position it's been a it's been a long time coming you can tell though that i'm like not even after that world cup performance i'm yeah. still not a thousand percent comfortable being like like my chest is not out yet mm. despite that world cup performance oh my, um, my chest is out for that one yeah there's no doubt oh I mean, my chest is out from that yeah celebratory yeah but still not quite out uh predictive yeah. Like, like I said, after after Canada came back from 10 in, in, in the fourth quarter to, to beat Spain to finally qualify, a Spanish team, by, by the way, was the first time in like 20 years, I think, roughly, that they didn't finish in the top four of any mm -hmm. tournament. They were, they were in the top four every single tournament. Canada knocked them out and came back in doing so. I'm and fascinated it, to see how they look, just like as they yeah, enter this kind of, like, sure. like la you know, that was kind of the last of that era, and now we're heading into kind of the next era of Spanish yeah. basketball. But uh, that to me was like, I compared it at that time, um, to when Kawhi hit the shot for the Raptors. It was like, you know what? There was a reason to be to be doubtful and things usually cut against the program. Like things usually cut against the Raptors, things usually cut against Canada. But once they got over that, that hump, it was just like, let's just try to believe in the group. And yeah, I mean, last summer felt really great. Hopefully it'll be like that again. Um, 
as we pivot back to the NBA, I know we went around the NBA yesterday, but there's actually a lot more to go around the NBA, including a very spectacular night in basketball last night. And one thing you really wanted to talk about was just the two incredible dunks by Anthony Dude. Edwards. Uh, and also by Jalen Johnson. Jalen Johnson would have had the dunk of the night, except for the fact that Anthony Edwards also did what he did. So Anthony Edwards, like, look, you're right. Jalen Johnson on Austin Reeves with like almost cleared him entirely with the legs, legs wide over, like almost oh, yeah, like yeah. barely the he shorts barely brushed. Exchange. Yeah, um, <laughs> it was nasty. Yeah, but Anthony Edwards uh -huh. was so violent yeah. <laughs> that John Collins and Anthony Edwards were both injured on the dunk. John Collins had like a head contusion or something. Anthony yeah. Edwards, like briefly, I don't know if it was a dislocation or just like sprained a finger or whatever yeah. on the like get out the way part of the dunk. Oh, wow. And then you get all these like all of these different angles and each one's more violent than yeah. the last. Kyle Anderson looked like it. <laughs> As he, Anderson, as, he, as he watched that happen. And then yeah. you get Anthony Edwards watching it back, <laughs> reacting to his own dunk. Yeah, um, really man, well done. It's incredible. Like, yeah. Anthony Edwards, we are like two weeks removed from Anthony Edwards having what I thought was going to be the highlight of the season yeah. with that game-saving block Dude. where also I thought he was, like, severely injured he on that hit play. hit his head on the underside of the rim. And just, like, landed flat on the ground like you bailed on a skateboarding trick. Like, just... Yeah. Like Tony Hawk style, your body just kind of flails along he the, the half pipe. Ten feet. Like, yeah. yeah, and he was fine. And then yeah. he, and then like two weeks later, he's out here with this dunk. I mean, we yeah. talked a lot about Anthony Edwards yesterday with Hanif. You're right. Um, yeah. Man, very, 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 yeah. very, very cool. Um, obviously, they they beat the Jazz in that game as well. And Anthony Edwards had like 32 and eight. Um, yeah, yeah. But man, and very few guys as exciting as Anthony Edwards right now. I love so much that he has the personality and the playfulness. And the confidence and like just he really goes about this and enjoys every single step. And then he goes on the court. And yeah, there's lots of times you watch Anthony Edwards. You're like, ah, he's taking a lot of bad shots or he's not really engaged. But then when he flips that mode and he gets engaged and it's not just on offense, but it's on defense as well. When he flips into this mode, you really about business. He's really about he's terrifying, man. He's absolutely terrifying. I also do enjoy the fact that you were going to get like one or two of these spectacular highlights per year if not per month, from Anthony Edwards. And we're in a really good place highlight-wise, just between him, between, you know, Wemby, other guys like that, or the shot-making by a number of players around the league now. But, I mean, after you saw what Edwards is, after you saw what um, what Jalen Johnson did as well, where, again, he put... Um, Austin Reeves. Austin Reeves. Yeah, he put Austin Reeves in a poster, and he put him in a compromising position as well. Um, <laughs> but in any case... Those are, I assume, two of your dream dunk contest field, right? Yeah. Edwards and Jalen Johnson. Who are the other two for you? If you had to build a hypothetical, Man. everybody has to say yes, dunk contest. Yeah. In the NBA. I still want Zion in there. Okay. I, yeah. I think he's, yeah. he's Zion in there. Zion did say he was going to do it, right? If he's in the All-Star game. If he's all He said game. if he's already okay. in the All-Star game. Well, he's playing like an All-Star um, right now, so. He'll do that's it. That's easy. So, I don't know. Do you, do you have to have a... Uh, Matt, Matt McClung in there. <laughs> no, I'm good. I'm, I'm I'm okay. Like you did it twice. Congratulations. Anyway, yeah, I, I, I want to see Jaw. Jaw was my fourth. Yeah, I yeah. think Jaw's a Jaw's a good pick. He hasn't done it before, right? No, he only did the skills competition. I think. If you, right? you know what, no, uh, has he done uh, abolished the skills competition too? Actually, while we're at it, but yeah, although he's he's, he's said he won't do the dunk contest. Why? Um, what is the reason to not do the dunk contest? So he said it in 2023. After that dunk contest, uh, I'm not doing the dunk contest, he said, during his all-star media ability. Everyone knows I can dunk. I'm just locked right in. I'm locked in right now and focusing, just trying to do the stuff here with my teammates and get wins. Oh, oh um, he said... Then he went on IG and, and oh, showed yeah. a gun. Like, what? So, no, do the dunk contest. Oh, this is, the, this is a great quote. So he, he joked that it would, it would take more than a million dollars, and then someone asked how much, and he said 10. I need 12 millions. I got I got Pampers and stuff to buy. I got Pampers. Yeah, okay. 12 million. I mean, listen, if you can yeah. get, if you can promise that you're going to Anthony Edwards, Jalen Johnson, uh, Zion Williamson, and John Morant fully going 100% in the dunk contest, yeah. I think they can raise 10 million. I actually think, though. Like, yeah. that, I would need to see all four of those guys. This is and honestly expand I, the field. I want to see Wemby in the dunk contest, yeah. too, by the way. Yeah, yeah, I would be down. Like, the Vince Carter one was eight guys or six guys. Something like that. It was yeah, bigger than day, four, anyway. Yeah. Um, that one, like, star players, especially young star players. I'm not expecting, like, I don't know, Paul George to get in the dunk contest at his big age. Yeah. You know what I mean? But, like, his big age. <laughs> what is he, like, 34? <laughs> like, God, what an oldie. Um, but, like, yeah, I mean, for the young guys coming up, like, that was 
every star player who could remotely dunk did it. Like, in that dunk contest, like, who else was in a dunk? Like, Michael Finley was in that dunk contest? Yeah, like, Jerry Stackhouse. On. Jerry Stackhouse, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, like, they could dunk-ish, but yeah, it's a coming out moment for these young guys and, you know, just showcasing what you can do. I would love to see that. But, yeah, shout out to Anthony Edwards. Yeah. Amazing dunk. Um, You know, someone who has never dunked. Transitioning. Trey Young has literally never dunked oh. in... Like all six seasons. I was wondering where you're going with that. I didn't know. I was like, <laughs> was Fred in the news? What's going on here? Yeah. So Trey Young in six full NBA seasons has not dunked. Um, I'm. I think he can dunk. Um, you know, because I've also seen Marquise Noel dunk. But in any case, um, yeah. What's something you haven't done since uh 2018? That was my question. Oh. Out of this Trey Young never dunking in six oh. seasons. So def Trey Young can definitely dunk. I, I just quickly searched Trey Young dunks, and there are like a bunch of him like in practice okay, or yeah, just yeah. like messing around he's or whatever. Not that short, like right? no, he's, he's like, like throwing self volley oops off the backboard yeah, and, and right. like he just has never done it in the game. I you know Trey Young you know do a dunk. Show us yeah. a little, show us a little something. I haven't dunked since 2018 either. So. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever dunked in your in your in your no? Peak, in your so physical obviously peak. I do not look like I'm in my physical peak right now. Uh -huh. There was a point in time in my mid 20s where I could get like I could grab the rim and I could get dunked by the or I could get blocked by the rim. Okay. Um, which All I'm right. five foot ten. That's, That's not bad. Good. That's I, good. I felt pretty good about yeah. getting up that high. That was probably like. Yeah. I was like, I worked out every day and like played hockey like four Got times you. a week and stuff like that. I was, uh, that was a long way from where I am now. Yeah. Um, what about you? You're way, you're much taller than me. I, I'm much taller. I think it's a little exaggerating. I mean, you're probably like four or five inches taller than me. I'm, yeah, I'm like, I'm like six two, you know, in the right shoe kind of thing. Um, I have never been a high leaper, but I, in, in high school, I used to really enjoy like leapfrogging people. Okay. So I can leak. The tallest person I've leapfrogged was like So you're six the worst feet. dunk contest participant. You're one of those, like, I'm going to go up on this yeah, guy and yeah. push off his shoulder right, right. To, uh, to go over. Now, if I put on a glove and my name was Jalen Brown, I probably would have got a 50 for that. Yeah. But, like, in any case, yeah, that, that's about as close as I can get. But, no, I, I think I can touch the rim in my, in my peak, but that's it. I, I, I don't have, like, big enough hands to palm the ball to help dunk the ball. Yeah. yeah. I've this also, is this is a weird thing, and probably because most of my athletic – life was playing hockey and it's yeah. it's a different coordination set but like the the optimizing your jump off of one leg versus just like i so naturally just want to like gather in two footed jump right the volleyball kind of spike jump. yeah one two three yeah yeah um, um that's yeah what is the most athletic thing you've done mm, i was actually thinking about this recently because like obviously yeah. uh, across all sports i think like dunking is probably the coolest feeling of anything you can do in a sport um I have homered in a baseball game before a That's couple cool. a couple times. That like the how first, far was the fence? I mean, I don't know. Standard like softball length oh, fence, yeah. like okay. not not yeah, like yeah. a rinky dink fence, but right. like there are like in I played like fairly competitive slow pitch, and there would usually be like between the two teams, like maybe four home runs in a game. Mm. So it's not like incredibly okay. rare, yeah. but yeah, I uh, that the first time I I went yard, and like I didn't play baseball growing up, yeah. so like the first time I went yard was probably like the coolest like athlete feeling that that i've had that's sure. a, that's not like athletic in the like burst style of yeah. athletic but that was that was very cool i mean look let's to be clear the, the reason you and i do media is yeah. in part because we're not particularly good at sports yeah if um, i had been if i had stayed any level of good at hockey yeah. i would have done something there i think honestly for me i've thrown like a 40 foot frisbee pass for a game winner in overtime once okay. which is really fun it was actually again in high school um loved ultimate frisbee i love being a handler as well kind of like quarterback although there's like multiple quarterbacks that was really cool and then i remember like best goal ever in soccer i was from like 30 yards out and it was like one of those like all right the run's about to end like last goal wins type of deal and i just blasted one uh and it went like top corner like very 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 like honestly i very rarely score goals nice. and this uh, is one at lampard and you like eat the shirt <laughs> over your head and you're knocking on my door when i lived in liberty village ah! Honestly, that it was that level. Zarrar was there for that run. Wow. It was his run. And my dad happened to be subbing in. Anytime I get to impress my dad in sports, I think it's probably the, the highest achievement I can do. So That's, I uh, my yeah. favorite hockey one, and this isn't like I've I've like I was a pretty good goal scorer. Like I, I've had to, but my yeah. favorite, like, and this is more this is a cheeky one, not an athletic one. Okay. But at the Cambridge Center, the mall in Cambridge, there used <laughs> sure. there yeah. used to be an ice rink adjacent to the food court. So okay. if you were in the food court in the Cambridge Mall, there was hockey going on. And one, if you're shooting in one direction, it leads uh -huh. directly to the food court. So oh, that, wow. that rink isn't there anymore. But okay. I used to play in a men's league there yeah. um, in like, this would have been like, I don't know, 2011 or 2012 or something True, like yeah. that. And I got a penalty shot in the direction of the food court uh -huh. and snuck one, like a cheeky little one five hole Ooh. on the goalie. Um, nice. Obviously, like 
no one is paying attention. I thought, like, you were, I thought the story was going to end with you hitting somebody and knocking the Carl's court. Jr. out of their hands. No, like, yeah. So like, what for Wednesday, not till today. No, like, someone's like, got the Manchu walk going and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, oh, and they just God. like fall out of their chair with orange chicken everywhere because I scored this unbelievable goal. Uh, um, no, that was like that awesome. was the funniest one of just like I'm gonna sneak a little yeah. five hole here in front of the food court at Christmas time. All right, uh, no, no dad or Zarrar at that one though. Yeah, well, you know, you can't have them all uh, at all these events. Um, there's actually a really impressive stat that you want to present for the next yeah, one. Yeah, it is time now for the spicy stat of the day, brought to you by New Chunky Spicy Soup. Are you ready to get fired up? So. Last night, the Sacramento Kings, who admittedly I have not been the biggest respecter of, uh, they have to go to overtime mm -hmm. against the zombie Memphis Grizzlies. They end this up, is why you can't respect them. They got to go to overtime for Memphis? They end up Come going on, to man. OT against the Grizzlies. They win that one, 121-111. Yeah. Right, yeah, sure. DeMontis Sabonis does what he does. Has a monster stat line. Wasn't the most efficient night, but he goes 25-18-5. and five. Okay, yeah. Really good stat line. Yeah. That was DeMontis Sabonis's. 50th double double yeah. in a row. Yo, that blew me. 49 away. of those have been points rebounds. He had one where he didn't get the rebounds, but he had 10 assists. Okay. So he snuck wow. in there. 50 nice. consecutive double doubles. Damn. He has had 21 triple doubles during that 50 game yeah. streak. Wow. He has averaged 21, 14, and 9. So he's right. almost averaged a triple double over that 50 game stretch. There are only eight other players in NBA history mm -hmm. who have who have put up a double double in 50 consecutive games. Elgin Baylor, yeah. Walt Bellamy, Wilt Chamberlain, Elvin Hayes, Jerry Lucas, Moses Malone, Bill Russell, and Kevin Love. So Kevin Love, the only yeah. other guy you'd call well. remotely modern to put up 50 straight double-doubles. Uh, DeMontis Sabonis has done it now. Again, 21 triple-doubles in that stretch and almost averaging a triple-double. I am still not a big believer in the playoff version of the Sacramento Kings, but I do think I am guilty of this mm -hmm. and a playoff focus. Every So much of the discourse that we do yeah. is playoff focus. This is a Kings team that is 11 games over 500, and DeMontis Sabonis on the season is averaging 20, 14, and 8 while shooting 61% wow. from the field. So just wanted to take a moment for the spicy stat and also for, look, yeah, again, just, double, double, just right. because you might not win a playoff series with this particular group does not mean what you guys have done over the course of the last two regular seasons is not crazy impressive. DeMontis yeah. Sabonis is awesome, man. Dude. This is unbelievable. I actually I could not believe it when you told me that this that was was, was what it was for him. Had <laughs> fifty straight double doubles is is incredible yeah! for them. Who do you think is the best player on that team though? Him or Fox? I think best, like the overall impact is Sabonis. Okay. Um I, I think they have a good dynamic where like Fox yeah, is the true. guy who's who I want the ball in his hands. Well, that's one of the reasons they're, the they're, spot, they're also right? a, a crunch time merchant is that when you can run that good of a pick and roll combo yeah. late. Yeah. Well, this is this is how you end up eleven games over five hundred by barely outscoring your opponents. Right, is right. like you have like Fox won the Clutch Player of the Year last year. He's in the mix again. Mm -hmm. Like he's putting up what like twenty seven points a game, and he's he's almost as efficient as last year. So um, I think Sabonis is still I I believe their best player, yeah. and like the ecosystem is built around him. But yeah, game on the line. I want that ball in De'Aaron Fox's hands, bro. For sure, for sure. It's a it's an interesting question. Um, let's let's do two more of these, and then let's go to break. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, do, do you want to do the, the Grizzlies one? Let's do the Grizzlies one. Okay. Yeah, we're on the subject of the Grizzlies. So yeah. in that game, the Grizzlies lost. So they pull a half game ahead right. of the Raptors for uh, the sixth worst record in the league. That's If you are someone who wants the Raptors to have the best chance of keeping their pick, the best chance at a number one pick, mm -hmm. the Grizzlies are the team you're keeping an eye on to see if the Raptors can jump them for sixth worst record. Here are what the schedules look like for these last two teams. Okay. Or for these teams the rest of the way. The Grizzlies play the Spurs twice and the Pistons twice and then play nine playoff teams. Okay. The All Raptors right. play the Wizards twice yeah. and the Nets twice and then play 10 playoff teams. So if you are looking at can the Raptors jump the Grizzlies, mm -hmm. they each play all playoff opponents except the Grizzlies get two against San Antonio and two against Detroit. The Raptors get two against yeah. Washington, two against Brooklyn. So... At least I think I'm, the Grizzlies are actually going to finish up with a record um, with a better record. Yes, than Toronto. So Toronto's actually been with with uh, better lottery odds. But yeah, Jaron Jackson Jr. played. Desmond Bain played. At least those guys have the capacity to play right now. Like Toronto's best players and like vitally crucial players like Jakob, like Scotty, they're both injured for the rest of the year basically. So like I don't know, maybe 
you can like see them push through. But generally speaking, they can't even play to the point where a lot of games are actually just like lost before they were like, come on, let's be honest. Before they play, play the magic the second time, I'm like, I, this is going to be an L the entire way. Yeah, not even like what? Oh, yeah. the magic lost Jonathan Isaac no. for the night. Okay, cool. Sure. Like stuff like that. And so I think at least for the Grizzlies, they have more of their pieces coming back. And they also have like, I don't know, like a couple of young guys that are really popular. Yeah. Like Gigi Jackson is just like consistently good for them. Also, isn't he like eight, 19 years old? Yeah, I think he was the youngest player in the draft. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah, with the Grizzlies, yeah. obviously Jaws a big loss, but it's more about the total, like like Marcus Smart, Zaire yeah. Williams, Derek Rose, Yuta Watanabe, Lamar Stevens, Brandon Clark, Vince Williams, all out. And right. then Luke Kennard missed that game last night, but he's only day-to-day. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's tough. Basically, what you're betting on is either the Raptors will lose more some of the Washington Brooklyn games or Memphis can upset a, a I could totally team. see the Raptors losing to not Washington as much but like even like uh the Nets because they have shot yeah. blocking they have size yeah that's like half the battle to beating the Raptors nowadays yeah yeah that Nets team is a tough watch I know you oh, watch I know you watched the Spurs watch. game the other night yeah but for them. the Spurs to be clear I was watching for the Spurs yes. in fact I was actually just watching for one player it was just Wemby yeah. they could just do an ISO cam on him not show me the rest of the game would be nice. All right, last one. Uh, okay, so we we touched on it briefly yesterday. I'll save the Bucks thing for for tomorrow because mm. we'll have more around the NBA to fill tomorrow. But um, Otto Porter did announce his retirement. Yeah. Um. So we didn't get to talk about this much. Otto Porter left the he when he was traded away from the Raptors. He was no longer on the injury report. He got to Utah. There was a bit of weirdness where the front office was like, "Yeah, we are aware of the the injury, but we don't really consider it injury." He's not on the injury report. Mm -hmm. Otto was like, "No, nah, I'm still dealing with stuff. Like, I'm not going to be in the lineup." Then he was questionable for his first game there, and then he was out. And then eventually they waived him, and he announced his retirement. A really heartfelt thing uh, that he he put up on his own, saying, "Hey." You know, I, I'm so thankful for my career. I, I've had a great time, but my body is just like not going to be able to do that. So um, a moment for Otto Porter, who obviously did not work out particularly well as a Toronto Raptor, but who has had a pretty good career taking the number three overall pick, mm -hmm. becoming a what at, for a little while looked like an unbelievable number three behind Bradley Beal and John Wall as a three and D as a very high end three and D guy with the wizards, eventually reinventing himself for the championship warriors playing 20 minutes a game during that title run. And then, yeah, at the end here, the, the body just didn't hold up. He had 14 three pointers as a Toronto Raptor over his two seasons here. Do you have a favorite? Uh, yeah. I mean, that's we, I think he played one game this year against the bucks and the Raptors beat the bucks in that game. And I'm like, Look, look, look what Otto's doing. This is why can't the rest of the players play like Otto for two years? Every yeah. time they put him in a game, it was like, oh, yeah, things go smoother when you have a guy out there who knows what he's right. doing and isn't making mistakes and stuff like that. And it's like, obviously, it was yeah. like a bit of a, you know, meme to, to the extent to which he couldn't play yeah, sure, or sure. would be in and out of lineups and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, that that game that they blew Milwaukee out early in the year. He, he was plus 11 in 15 minutes. Yo, I remember. And I was like, look, he's spacing out here. Look, he's rolling hard here. Look, he was in position defensively. They got a deflection here. So I think, like, on paper, it made it, he was a player that, especially for what the Raptors played previously in their previous roster build, you what you really needed was, like, one or two more shooters to be able to either space the floor, ideally handle the ball a little bit as well, but just, like, again, catch a shoot for threes and continue to play really good defense. And Otto would, like, have fit in perfectly with that. Now, of course, the Raptors signed him knowing that he had an injury history, and that his body had gone through a lot. And so how much more was he able to push through? Was he willing to push through? Especially when you're later on in your career like that, you're probably always going to have lots of lingering issues, putting aside the specific uh, history that he's got. But nevertheless, like, he made sense as a, as a, it just, I guess they took the flyer on him and it was the right flyer to take, but it just didn't ultimately work out. It, it was all. the right flyer to take yeah. if you believe that last year's team was going to be competitive, right? Yeah, because right. he's a guy who could, even if he only played 50 games or whatever, could slot in and do some of those mm -hmm. in-between things. Uh, he ends this year second on the team in net rating uh, behind <laughs> Marquise Noel's four minutes. Okay, well, you know, uh, a lot of players have no longer been uh, with the Raptors anymore. But yeah, he's uh, one of 28 players this season to wear a Raptors uniform and play actual NBA minutes, Blake. And, um, yeah, for Otto, I just, you know, I, I have some regret. There was a chance we were going to interview him for the show this year. And I had been given the scoop that uh, on one of the Raptors road trips, he, he binge watched all three Rush Hour movies. Oh, yeah. You brought so, this up before, yeah. <laughs> so I was really looking forward to talking to an NBA player about Rush Hour for five minutes. But nevertheless, happy retirement to Otto. He made, uh, you know, he made what? It was a third overall pick. He made a max contract in his career, and he got a ring. Like, you know what? He 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 
he he did what you needed to do, and I'm th- pretty sure he would be very happy looking back on that. So. Yeah, always seemed like a really good guy too. I always enjoyed guy, talking yeah. to him. I remember when he was with the Wizards, I did a feature on him um, oh, for Dime, I think, because he spent that whole series guarding Demar Derozan. Yeah, and I was right. I talked to him throughout the series about like what is the defensive side of adjusting to an individual match because no one other than him was going to guard Demar. Um, Are you talking 2015 or 2018? The 2018. Okay, okay. Because 2015, when he guarded Demar, like Demar could not yeah. do anything. So no, this like, was 20. All. This yeah. was 2018 because I leaned on the 2015 yeah, experience. Right, right. And then also, you know, there was an element in 2018 of he was really banged up. Like that's when he was playing through that hip injury that I think playing through probably sped up the deterioration stuff. Right. Um, got you. But he wanted to play through it, so I, it was cool. I uh, I went back and read that piece not long ago, actually, because I, I was just, like, curious. I didn't remember, other than that I wrote it, I didn't remember what, much of what Otto said. Mm-hmm. It was kind of cool, yeah. Like, we think of Damar as, like, this very difficult to guard guy who has a lot of counters and adjustments. Well, what's the other side of that? Like, how are you trying to counter to what Damar shows you? Cool. Well, yeah. Um, happy retirement to Otto Porter. And uh, we're going to take our last break. I've been your host, Willu. You've been listening to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soup. Welcome back to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Network. I'm your host, William Liu. Continue to be joined by co-host Blake Murphy. As we discussed earlier in the program, the Olympic pools uh, have been determined both for the men's and the women's side. And uh, yeah, we really wanted to get somebody to talk about and react to this. So who better than the head coach of the Canadian senior women's team, Victor LaPena, joining us on the program. Victor, thanks for uh, taking the time. Thank you very much for having me here. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, So we got to ask you, your uh, initial reactions to being drawn into a pool with Nigeria, with Australia, with France, again, for context, not that FIBA rankings are everything, but they do give you an idea. Nigeria is the 12th ranked team in the world. Australia is the third. France is seventh. And Canada is fifth. Your reaction, coach? Uh, first of all, I would like to say that we are very happy to be in the Olympics, you know, and there uh, will be the best 12 teams in the world. So this is the, my first, uh, my first house, you know, so then, uh, I think everybody's staff at the Olympics, you know, we have to, to compete again, like, uh, we build, uh, oh, we belong our momentum from the world cup. Uh, I think it's, uh, uh, with uh, how we are changing the generation here in Canada, how these uh, young players are competing and mixing with uh, other players with experience like uh, Natalie Chowa or Ken Urs, uh, Rita Carlenton. I think we are building a, a great team, great atmosphere. Uh, and my feeling is like uh, we are able to compete against everyone uh, in the world. So our first reaction was just to uh, some nervous. You know, we are waiting for this moment after our last qualification. So if we uh, work really, really hard from now to to the Olympics, I think the team will be in a very good position to 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 get our goal. Uh, our goal should be to play the quarterfinals and then there to dream. Yeah, why not to play semifinals after, I don't know how many years ago, but I don't want to... <laughs> Think about it. Um, okay, so, so coach, I want to go back to that Olympic qualifying tournament where it came down to uh, a tough one there, watching Spain come back against Hungary. You, of course, have lots of roots in the, the Spanish organization there. What was that experience like for you, um, you know, not controlling your own outcome and having to root for Spain to, to kind of help you guys out there? Uh, oh, man, it was... Like a roller coaster, you know. Is uh, I didn't want to watch the game. I was with uh, uh, very good friends with uh, Mike Barrett, our president and CEO, with uh, Denise in our GM, and with uh, Mal Davison, uh, our on the podium person. So uh, I was very very sad because uh, we got that moment in a with a very serious problems. First of all, the key injuries, uh, the key injury was terrible for us in the first day during the camp. Uh, some players, sensitively players were not able to be with us. Uh, we have some people not playing uh, at the highest level. So our um, performance was not good at the moment. But anyway, we compete. We beat the host and we compete amazing against uh, Spain and, and Japan. Maybe just with Kianus. 
I think we have the option to play in a separate position, but this is what it is. It's part of uh, basketball. It's part of a sport. So during during the game, yes, I received some messages. You know, at the halftime, oh, Spain is losing by twenty-two, <laughs> and then you know, it was the key for me because I know how the Spanish players are. You know, and even the messages the messages from their federation, from the Spanish federation. Hey, we are Spain. This is not serious. We have to come back to the game and to win. And I think I have information no, from my people there, no, assistant coaches, they have, and I think they talk each other, they back to the game, and then the Spanish players experience did the best, the rest, you know. So uh, uh, once the, the, this game finished, uh, I almost start to cry and to have a lot of emotions in my heart, in my mind, because I think Canada deserves to be there. Yeah. I think what we are doing in our program is amazing so uh, we are in the best 12 teams in in the world and let's enjoy it again i think uh i think first off canada yeah definitely owe spain a favor because the men's also kind of qualified courtesy of the spanish side as well yeah. of course that one canada yeah. directly defeating uh spain to, to qualify uh in last year's yeah. world cup you know i, I think it's yeah. not lost on me the fact that canada's program is now being led by two spanish coaches right you Victor, and also with Jordi Fernandez on the men's side as well. Um, you know, in your conversations with the CEO, with, with Mike Barlow, with Rowan, people like that, um, what is it about the Spanish program that Canada really wanted to bring and emulate uh, those uh, facets? Um, I don't know if it's from the Spanish program. Uh, it's more from... Uh, how we build in Spain during a lot of years. I mean, during I remember my first time in the Spanish Federation was in 2007. I was in this organization during 10 years. And how we, we build the, 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 the competitiveness of the players, especially, you know, the, because uh, physically or in terms of uh, bodies, I think uh, Canada, and another country like France are much better than Spain. But then to, to transmit to the players and to give to the, to the players the experience they need from their young, uh, in terms of exhibition games, how to compete any game, how to be able to, to win games uh, at the, in the start of the game, et cetera, et cetera. I think Spain is uh, one of the best uh, teams in the world. So I think we are pretty good in that. And what I did here yeah, was to analyze everything, to try to adjust myself myself to the Canadian culture, and then to transmit to the program that we have to give to the kids all the experience they need to compete because it's very difficult in Canada to get exhibition games. If you compare a kid with 14 years old or 13 years old with um, European kids, uh, when they become senior athletes, maybe the European uh, players uh, played minimum, let's see, 40 games, and the Canadian player played 12, 15. This is the great difference. You know, so I am encouraged our federation and encouraged with uh, our organization to, to continue working with the kids from their very young, to transmit the style of play from the senior team to the junior academy, with adjustment, for sure, with adjustment, we need to for that, and then to to give them the experience they need to uh, become a great players and very competitive players, you know. And maybe one day, with if we continue working in this way, I think one day Canada will be able to compete against even against USA and to beat them. Well, that would be uh, that'd be the. I mean, hey, beat them in a bronze medal game on the men's side this this time in the World Cup. So we're we're getting there. Yeah. Um, this is not exactly related to to that, um, but I'm I'm curious. What is your relationship like with Jordi Fernandez, the the coach of the men's team? Did you guys have a relationship before? Has that relationship picked up since he got the job uh, as well? No, 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 no. I, I uh, actually, I yes, I uh, had the opportunity to be with Jordi in some uh, uh, moments. Yes, uh, uh, talking with, with him a little bit, but we didn't have connection because uh, he uh, is involved in NBA and American basketball oh, a lot of time ago. 
you know, and I'm in, in women basketball. So we didn't have uh, a great relationship uh, from years ago, but we are building that here. So mm -hmm. uh, in the moment uh, when my Barlet uh, trust me, the idea to 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 hire Jordi for this organization, I was very happy and because uh, everybody respect uh, Jordi in Spain. I think is uh, he represent for Spanish coaches what you have to do to to become a great mm -hmm. coach in in America, you know, in North America. Uh, you know how difficult it is for a European coach to become a uh, head coach or, 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 or coaching in, in, in America, North America. So he built uh, her his own pathway. We respect uh, Jordi a lot. And then when I knew that uh, Jordi uh, was uh, selected to, to be a head coach of Canada. I was super, super happy. And I said to my Barlet, wow, I think it's a great choice for us. And hey, bronze medal, and <laughs> just in the first time. So yeah, uh, I'm very happy for, for him and for the men team and the men program because they are doing a great job. Yeah. Well, I want to ask about your team and your program as well. So we, we did see the, the, the qualifying tournament and, um, as you mentioned, you know, a couple of different circumstances came up. Um, I feel like, at least for us watching the strength of your team, I thought your front court played really well. I thought Natalie, uh, Kayla, you know, they really provided really strong efforts. Um, where, where do you assess the strengths and weaknesses, at least of your roster, at least heading into uh, this upcoming summer? No, I think will will be different. Will be different. Yes, because we'll have more time to be together. Okay. Uh, because... Uh, I hope uh, some players that were not able to be with us, uh, like Ali Edwards, mm -hmm. or Cassandra Prosper, mm -hmm. she was injured at that time, they will be with us. Then we, at that moment, we had Natalia Chowa, uh, Nauru Fels, Shea Colley, and Leticia, and Leticia Mihaila, and, and Kia Nurs mm -hmm. without competition. Mm -hmm. It's going to be very different now. Eh? Right. The three, three WNB players, and maybe four, if Ali. Uh, uh, made the, the make the, the the draft, and then the rest of the players in competition and with one, almost one month to prepare the team as best as possible with some exhibition games. So I think will be very very different in terms of preparation. Um, people healthy, I hope not injured, mm -hmm. and for sure to build uh, the culture and the relationship between the players and between uh, staff and, and and athletes. So. Uh, the group is not easy, for sure. Uh, Australia is the best, uh, the best team in uh, in Oceania. Uh, the last uh, World Cup they play Mason, they finish in the third position. And France is the host. And for sure, Nigeria is a good team too. No, yeah, they are building from the team from year, years ago. But I. I trust in, in my players. I, I, I don't know. Since I came here, uh, the heart of the, of the character and of, of the team impressed me. Uh, Canadian players have something that give me a lot of energy, a very good energy, you know? So I will, uh, what I want is to do my best, to be the best coach for them and to make the right decisions to get the Olympics and to and to play again a beautiful bas basketball like we did in the World Cup. When it comes to making those decisions, um, you you named a, a number of, of players with some good experience there. Some of them still on the young side coming out of the NCAA. Um, Silas Swords was with you guys in the qualifiers. When you look ahead mm -hmm. and when you look back at, at that and look ahead, um, for someone as young as her to get that experience with the senior team so early, mm -hmm. how important can that be for her and for you guys as you continue to build for future years as well? Mm, look, for me, it will be very easy to increase the list of the young players. Very easy. You know, to, hey, you and you and you and you. And then maybe you don't play us maybe a couple of minutes during the exhibition games, is there, but this is not my style. If I introduce a young player like a Sina Schwartz in the roster, it's because I want to give her the experience she needs to grow as a player, as a person, as a fit. So then it will impact in the program. Because if they, if she is in the roster and then she doesn't play, 
or she doesn't get the experience she needs. Like in the window, she played in the in some moments. Even I remember, I think it was a Spanish game. We were like a seven or ten points down, and with Sayla on the uh, on the court, we're back mm -hmm. to the game. You know, we're back to the game. So this is the kind of experience I would like to give them. I don't know if it's possible to give this kind of experience to all of them. I think we have to do to do this uh, uh, progressive, you know, gradually. And then, if we look for the future, the, the future is, is oh, it's bright future. Mm -hmm. And then we are working really hard with our junior academy kids with 30 or 14 years old. And the bodies we have here that leads we have here is, I never saw that in Spain. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So if we do the right steps, Canada basketball future is amazing. And then we are thinking, we are working in, in, in the right style of play, you know? to coach, uh, to teach coaches, to to analyze what is the right steps without to think that we are going to get everything this summer. No, hey, it's a tough group. Let's do our best. Let's play quarterfinals. And then why not like last time in the World Cup? Mm -hmm. If we play the semifinal, we have option, but don't press ourselves. We are in the best 12 teams in the world, and I think it's important to enjoy, enjoy this uh, opportunity. For sure. Well, Coach, we're, we're very much looking forward to, to watching, following along with the team. And, of course, you know, Canada's, Canada's in your hands, so no big pressure, you know. But uh, thank you so <laughs> no. much, Victor. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you very much. My pleasure. There you go. Victor Lopena, head coach of the uh, women's national team. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's gonna be exciting, man. It's uh, and, and you know, obviously, we can't put them too much on the spot about roster stuff right this ah, minute. It's a little too far but, out. Yeah, and yeah. but we we do have a sense that you know Canada, in addition to making the Olympics year like cycle over cycle over cycle, which is a really important thing for the program. You know, every program except for maybe the USA comes in waves, right? And there has been. Uh, Low key, uh, a little bit of a feeling that 2028 is kind of when the Canada, this wave of Canadian talent could okay. could peak. Given what you see in the NCAA right now, yeah, the, and yeah. and the youth of you know like Sila, if, if, for example, Leah coming out of out of college, and, and mm -hmm. the the way the program yes has veteran leaders, but the there's a good pipeline of talent that'll be in the early to mid 20s come 2028. Okay. Um, but it, I'm I'm pretty fascinated. Where whereas on the senior team. It's or on the men's team rather. It's very obviously about everything is maximizing what you can do in this Olympics because you got there. It's the first time in forever, and you believe that the talent pipeline is deep enough that you'll always be competitive from here moving forward. Or on the women's side, I do think there's probably at least a small element of you're balancing an eye to the to the long term uh, as well as as you build that team out. Now maybe not as extreme as Natalia Chama, who is going to be playing in her fourth Olympics because she joined the senior team so young. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, I do think you're, you're going to maybe see, uh, keep an eye toward 2028 as well. Well, look, I, I'm, I think everything is about timing, right? And I think if we do indeed have this crop of young Canadian women's talent coming up too, it'd be really great if we can also get a WNBA team so we can watch them play here in Toronto locally. But anyway, uh, that does it for us today. I've been your host, Willow. You've been listening to The Raptors Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's New Chucky Spice Soup. It's time to get fired up. Make sure you find The Raptors Show wherever you listen to podcasts. Subscribe. Please review the program. Big thanks to producer Ahmed Mana, Bird producer Derek Brindale, Jennifer Olnick, David Sis, Jared Manitad, helping behind the scenes. Big thanks to our guests today, James Herbert and Victor LaPena, and we will talk to you tomorrow.